Sam Bielski, what's up, buddy? All the way from LA. <laughs> what's up, man? I was going to say thanks for having me on your show in California and knowing nothing about me, man. Well, I mean, you know how it is with people from out of town. Like, you want to try to accommodate as many people as you can. For sure. So I saw you are now uh, doing a few shows since you've been in New York. So kind of talk about the process of potentially moving to New York, because that's something you might do, you were telling me. No, I think I am going to move here in December. So I know it's like it's cold as shit during that time. But um, I think it's just because there'll be more apartments available. It'll be a little bit cheaper that time of year. But why am I moving here? Um, Because I think that in Los Angeles in particular, um, if you want to just be a stand-up, it's kind of hard because you're inundated with all these people that are like trying to be in the industry. So like sometimes the stand-up scene can sort of feel like you're having to like network with people in the industry. Whereas here, it's just like people are just kind of doing stand-up and just writing jokes and stuff. But the thing that I've sort of noticed compared to here is like, it seems like here everybody books a show as well. And everyone's a little bit more serious here. And they're in more terms serious. Of stand-up comedy, that's kind of how it feels. Yeah, like in, in Los Angeles, it's kind of like everybody's kind of, they're like talking to you to see if you can give them something. You know, they're like feeling Interesting, it out. Interesting, man. So a, a good example of that would be like, and I'm a, I'm a, I'm a guy from the Midwest, so I'm, I try to be nice to just about everybody. But there was this guy that I met that was just being kind of a jerk, and then he found out I produced two shows, and then he was like, his whole attitude changed. And all of a sudden, he was like nicer and stuff. I'm sure that happens here, <laughs> but there's, there's a lot more stage time here, so I don't think people give as much of a shit because there's like limited. And I guess my other sort of, I mean, I like a lot of things about living there, but my, other, my only real gripe is that there's a lot of people that want to do shows, but they don't want to put in the effort to produce it and contribute in that way. Like they want to be given spots, but they don't want to like, you know, do that, you know, pr- contribute to more stage time. Well, it's also got to be hard, though, if you're not at like a super high level, maybe doing shows that you produce or doing shows at like the Laugh Factory or Comedy Store. Besides that, it's got to be pretty hard to get stage time in L.A., right? You, well, club stage time. Yeah. I mean, you can do any number of, of bar shows anywhere. You know, if you're passed at one of the big three clubs, you're fine. But, you know, that's then you're competing with the, the multitude of, you know, thousands or hundreds. But you of think in people. terms of a stand up looking to further their career to be at a point where they could just go to L.A., do the main three clubs there. I guess you're talking about the store, the Laugh Factory and Improv. The Hollywood Improv. Those, yeah. OK, so uh, just assuming that one would want to further their career. You think that now, like where you are right now, you think that coming to New York for an extended period of time. Um, is going to help you and then maybe you'd go back to LA or what is your mindset kind of? Well, I just don't, I don't think you, I think it's, I don't think you need to be in, in LA or, or anywhere anymore. Um, I, if I wanted to be an actor, I think that'd be something that's different, but I just want to do, get as good at stand up as I can with as many opportunities for quality stage time as I can. Cause I'm kind of realistic at where I'm at. It's, I'm not like a headliner. I'm not, you know, somebody that's, you know, featuring every weekend on the road. So I think like for me and, and my mindset is where's the best opportunity to get up the most to get the, the best. And know? that's probably New York in general, kind of wherever, whatever level you're really at. Yeah. You know, like mm-hmm. I stayed in Hollywood, like on the Hollywood Boulevard. And to get to your show, I was telling you, I was like, dude, I'll be there in 15 minutes. And no joke, MapQuest said 15 minutes. And then it just ended up taking 40 minutes, which I was like, do they not have satellites in L.A.? That's no, like the only place that doesn't work at. It just won't, sh- it won't show like if there's like a traffic jam or something. So that particular night, apparently the Hollywood Bowl had an event and then that's yes. just a nightmare of a, yeah. of a traffic situation. Russ was there. So for those who don't know the landscape of Los Angeles, there's what they call, what people consider LA. So like West Hollywood, Hollywood, the West Side, Santa Monica, uh, Venice, all that area. And then there's the San Fernando Valley which is over a hill and people act like there, they act like it's this big deal. Oh, is that North Hollywood they call it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so is that where the show was that we did? That's where it was. So um, I do one show in (laughs) Hollywood area proper and one in North Hollywood. Uh And North Hollywood, you the only real way to get there from where you were staying is to go down Hollywood and Highland. So you go down Highland, then there's the Hollywood Bowl, and then when that's getting out, it's a nightmare. Pass by that Lowe's, Lowe's Hotel. You're familiar with that one? Yes. And then I think the only real way to go is like up. You go past the Hollywood Bowl and then continue up to. Or you go through all the neighborhoods and stuff, which you know it's like windy and it's kind of nice. You see like where all the rich people live because they have all these houses on the hills and stuff. I mean, the, the LA comedy scene is is really good. Um, it's just. 
I think it depends on what your goals are because I don't want to like poo-poo it too much because it, it, there's a lot of really great up-and-coming comedians, comedians that are friend of mine, friends of mine that do really well and, and are really funny. But I thought the more you think about it, you're like, well, if I don't really want to be doing kind of acting stuff, you know, I mean, maybe write for a show and you just want to do stand-up and get better at stand-up, you know, doing, you know, four shows a week in L.A. is, is, is pretty good, comparatively speaking. But I know people here that are doing three shows a night. And in L.A., I can imagine just driving anywhere. You can only really do one spot a night, right? Yeah, you can only do like one spot a night. And then also um, some nights there's just there's just not as good of options. And it's also really spread out. So like you're, you're constantly discovering, OK, wow, there's this amazing show that I never heard of. But then the next the next hurdle is trying to get on it, you know, which is another battle in and of itself, because if you don't have any credits, like you're competing with people that have started, been here for years and then got credits, then moved. Now they're writers. Now they're, you know, this and that they're, you know, at the club. So it's not that the competition is more fierce. It's that there's less spots and, and you, it seems to be inundated with people that are, you know, have been here or, you know, been in LA for a long time. Granted, I cannot personally complain because I get up like, you know, 15, 17 times a month. So I'm not, I'm not complaining about myself. I have friends that, that do, you know complain about it and i would say from their from a standpoint with them they're just if you produce a show and you're contributing people will trade spots more often right but so, there just seems to be a lot more of that here and also in new york here like you could go to a free show in bushwick i'm not sure how familiar you are with i know with bushwick because okay. I mean, when, when i lived here in 2014 <laughs> oh okay so you've been here I, i've lived here for several years before before i got into stand-up like right out of college but when I lived here, Bushwick was like the up and coming neighborhood. Yeah. And Bed Stuy was. And I'm sure now it's like fully gentrified. Yeah. So now Bushwick, they have a few comedy bars, comedy places or whatever. And you could go to a free show on a Wednesday night at 9 p.m. and see some of the best comics in New York City. Where in, in L.A., maybe you, you're talking about like, oh, yeah, you wouldn't see the best comics in L.A. at uh, on a Wednesday night at 9 p.m. in San Fernando Valley, something like that. Yeah, you'd see you'd see like oven comers at like the Ha Ha Cafe, right, 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 right. North Hollywood. Hollywood comedy club. I mean, the Ice House is reopening. I don't know much about what that's going to. Where's that? Like. Pasadena. But l moving here in December, you said it's obviously going to be very cold, which it will be. Is that when your lease is up out there? My lease is up in November, so I'm gonna take a month. You know, that month in between to like travel for ho the holidays, and then come out here sign a lease that's great man and you're here for how long or you've been here for how long i've been here for a week and how many spots are you gonna end up getting um so my last spots tonight and uh in Gen i got about eight spots since i've been here that's great dude but that's i mean great. i granted i know like if you live here it's different you know it's always easier out of town well but visiting. still i mean even getting a getting a show a night when you're here has got to be pretty difficult to, co to coordinate especially when you don't know your lay of the land that well right I know people who live here that have been helping me out. Okay. So I know people who I met. Well, so like one comic I started with in Austin who lives here now has been really like grinding out in the scene and, and it can kind of like refer me to her group of friends that do a lot of like the, the B club, like the McDougal Street B club type of things. And then I say B club because they're not like... Um, they're not like the comedy seller. They're all the other ones. Yeah, they're the stand. Like, they're a comedy club. Whatever. Yeah, whatever. And... Um, and then obviously meet people who came through LA and, and did shows and you know for the most part people are pretty pretty good about like hey yeah I'll throw you up like you did yeah so you <laughs> moved in 2014 to New York 2014 2016 where yeah. did you go to college Kansas State University oh wow man so super Midwestern well I'm not from Kansas I okay. should preface that even for me I'm from Detroit now when I went to Kansas to visit I thought that cornfields were like the coolest thing because Detroit area there's the metro Detroit area most of Michigan is what you think of when you think of the suburbs so it's like or what do you think of the Midwest it's like rural agriculture green, green well yeah green lake there's lakes most and month, stuff yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, it's, <laughs> I'd say more gray because okay, it's okay. cold most of the, it's like I tell people it's like South Canada uh, Michigan uh, okay so the Detroit area you have Wayne County Oakland County which are the like Oakland County is the suburbs of Detroit which is in Wayne County and I never left Oakland or Wayne County. So I was always in this like inundated circle of where I grew up. I didn't really realize that until like I left. I was like, you know what? I actually don't think I know where anything else in Michigan is. Did you feel like a small town, like suburban kind of kid? Uh, it there? felt like that. It was like, I was like in, I grew up right outside of Detroit. So it was like a big city, but then my neighborhood was like a 70% Jewish 
small, like kind of small, like one square mile city, like right outside of Detroit. So I I would go and venture out, but I mean, there weren't really a lot of reasons to leave. Did you have a bar mitzvah? No. Oh, okay. My mom's Catholic. Oh, okay. So you were like raised Catholic? Raised kind of mixed, you know. So what was the thought process in going to Kansas State and did you visit before? Um, the thought, well, so I, I, I initially went, well, I mean, the real story is, is actually just kind of embarrassing. I got really bad grades in high school. <laughs> um, I think that's embarrassing, bro. Pretty, pretty standard for comedians, I think. I had like a 1.7 GPA, which is pretty bad for anybody's standards. But I got, yeah. a, I got an okay ACT score. And okay. I, I mean, I, got ma- I, I don't remember how I did. I think I got like a 23, which is pretty, still pretty low. But, uh, but it was enough to get into. I was like, my options were I got denied from every school I applied to except for two. I got denied from even the shitty Michigan schools, like Central Michigan like University. Eastern Missi- Michigan. Yeah, like all those shitty schools that you need a pulse to get into. I got denied from Arizona State. Bro, but that's a, that's a tough school, I feel like, from out of state also. I do think Even that though they get a lot of shit for being, like, the party school, yeah, it's I mean, got to be a little bit hard to get it's into. Not as, it's better than people think, I guess. I mean, I didn't, I, I, I didn't think I was going to get in. I applied, and then I went on this college um, GPA lookup thing for schools that you can go to and I found Kansas State University of Wyoming that could have been fun <laughs> well I don't know I might be I might not be here I might be on a pasture somewhere <laughs> <laughs> working on a farm I don't know um, and then um, Saginaw Valley State which is a division two school in Michigan I got in on academic probation so I'd have to keep a 2.0 my first semester so I got into Kansas State because my um, Kansas needs people. So they do it based on either your GPA, which out of state you need a minimum of a 2.5. I didn't have that. I had a 1.7. But I did, you need a minimum of a 21 on the ACT, and I got a 23. So I got into college. And so I went to Kansas State, and then, you know, I took school a little bit more seriously there. I still graduated with a 2.5 when I graduated college. Where'd you go from there? From there, I went to New York. Yeah. So I was, it, you know, moved there from there to here. So Manhattan, Kansas to Manhattan, New York. And then, so I don't think I told Oh my you. God, dude. Sorry to mean to interrupt you. I was in Puerto Rico one time and the, some lady, it was, it was probably 11. She was like, where are you from? I was like, oh, Manhattan. And she was in Manhattan, Kansas. I was like, what is this lady <laughs> talking about? Yeah, I mean, uh, you wouldn't know unless you like grew up a Big 12 fan, you know. So I moved out here and then I guess I, I we haven't talked about this, but I'm six years sober. So I'm an ex-drug and uh, alcohol addict. And nice, then, bro. Congrats. So yeah, basically as soon as I moved here, I, I, my, I, my life became a mess pretty quickly. Really? What were you doing here though? Like job wise? Uh, I was a, I was selling, um, debt settlement programs. Where? Uh, like 34th street. 34th and like whatever Penn station yeah, right in the Penn mix. Station. Where were you living at the time? Uh, my first apartment was in Washington Heights. Wow. That's a long journey. Uh, you take the A train express all the way down. How long did that take? Do you remember? 40 minutes? Uh, I think without, without like rush hour so like without clogging the trains it was like 35 40 minutes and it was just you living up there no i had three roommates and your roommates were a bad influence on you no i was a bad influence on myself they I mean, were random roommates they're just random people yeah i mean i moved there i've done this a few times but i've moved places it's like three or four times in my life not knowing anybody that doesn't really intimidate me necessarily what the problem was is like i didn't i was drinking every night in college did, where'd you go to college? Me too, dude. UConn. Okay, UConn. So probably a pretty decent party school. Yeah. East Coast party school. Yes. So I was drinking every night and I was like, that was fine. Normal in college. Everything was cheap. Like my rent was for my one shitty one bedroom that was like slanting. That was like a house that they partitioned it like in for. like 500 bucks. It's like $400. <laughs> <laughs> I was working at Subway. I was paying my rent. I moved here and I think my, my salary was, you know, my rent was not expensive. I, was, I had roommates in Washington Heights. So my rent was like $750. Okay. So it wasn't a lot. But my salary right at school, you know, first job was like forty thousand dollars. Oh, that's not bad though. Yeah, like I'd make commission, but I never got to the point of making commission because I got fired after three months because I was showing up to work late every day, you know, hungover and stuff. Where were you drinking? How did you spiral into drinking and then getting I mean involved so the, in drugs? The drug started once the drinking became too expensive. So you got into drugs and I was a I did crack and heroin for a little while. And then I, so, I mean, I did, that was on and off. So I was homeless and I would hustle 
Damn, I, didn't, I guess bro. I didn't. I guess you don't know any of this because I don't. I didn't talk about it when you were there. Yeah, but I'm really. I'm not like. Oh, hey, I'm. I was home. No, we had uh, Derek Dresher. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. Derek Dresher was on the podcast and he was talking about how he was a heroin addict for years, and he was saying that doing heroin is like the best feeling you could ever do in life. No, it's like a like Louis C.K. is that joke like drugs are so good they'll ruin your life kind of thing. It's true with heroin. Yeah, it's exactly the same. It's so good. It's like you don't really care about anything. It's, I, I think Artie Lang put it in a really good way because I, I think I listened to a, uh, a podcast with him and for some reason I relate a lot to his stories because I feel like I did a lot of the same things when I was using. But he says heroin doesn't make you forget your problems. You just don't give a shit. So like it just I just wouldn't give a shit. You'd just be high all the time. It was it's really it really is. I mean I'm, I shouldn't glorify it, but it, it feels great. It ruins your life almost immediately. So. I did that on and off for two for two years here, and I was homeless, and so I would like, I would I was one of those people where I'd stand by the um, the metro card and ask for a couple bucks until I get enough money, and then go you know and repeat that process over and over again. Damn, what was harder to kick? I mean, obviously they were both hard to kick, crack or heroin. I think heroin's the hardest thing to kick, hands down, because it's just so it's it, it fucks it literally fucks with your brain. It, with your opioid receptors. So, but how did you kind of get involved in this? Like, from drinking in college, you moved to New York City, you got a good job, it sounds like, yeah. and then it just, drinking became too expensive, but where did you go? Where was your outlet after you were like, all right, I'm not hitting the bar after so work So, the way it worked for me was, so in college, yeah, I mean, my life was on a trajectory to be like your typical all-American kid, go to college, get a good job, work your way up the career ladder, you know, et cetera. Um, where it went wrong was I was drinking, showing up to work late, lost my job after like two months because I don't know what my brain was like I'll be an hour late and it'll be fine I also didn't really take into consideration that when they kind of threaten your job they actually mean it I just wasn't responsible by any means you were young too delusional I was 22 yeah and then once the income money stopped you know it wasn't like you could go and you know it was just easier to find people when you're like desperate that are on, like involved in that kind of stuff. So I never really did drugs, but then you start, and then you start, you know, you can't find alcohol, but the guy's like, okay, I have, I have crack. You when know? was the first time the situation like this happened? Do you remember? Yeah, so it was like right after I, right after I got fired, I made a deal with my landlord because I said I, I made a, a, some kind of convenient excuse. And, you know, because... Because, uh, you know, my landlord was a nice guy and, and tr- you know, probably trusted me when he shouldn't have. So it was probably about a month after that I was on, I got kicked out of the apartment. Not evicted because I was on a month-to-month lease. Because the original plan was I was going to live in this apartment for a while, get the lay of the land, move somewhere else. So he could kick me out at any point he wanted. And so that's when it was. So that's when it was like, oh, shit, you know, I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do. And that's when, you know, you, you just kind of, you know, just meet people who are out all the time and you see him around you know and you strike up a conversation you don't know any better you're drunk you know maybe i maybe i would like hustle 20 bucks go to the bodega they'd like dollar bud lights you drink like in my case i drink like 15 of them you'd be wasted it's like three o'clock in the afternoon you f- you meet people who are in, you know involved in this stuff and then you try it and then it's like then you know it's there so it started more with like crack for me and then you know heroin was only kind of a shorter period for me it was maybe like eight months of heroin before i got sober was there a specific moment though that you remember when you were drunk that you first tried either of those things yeah i think i was like i was like i'm tired you know but and he said you know try this it'll like i, I can't remember the exact conversation he was like this will this will kind of kick you up a little bit you know and it's crack so it's, it's super addicting so you know then it becomes like then it, then it's pretty much your, your whole mission is to find a way to make enough money to, I'm sure Derek talked about it, your whole, your whole goal is to fi- figure out how you're going to fund your addiction. So your life becomes funding your addiction, getting high, kicking, you know. What do you mean by kicking? Like you're, kick, you're, like, you're like starting to um, go through withdrawals. And how soon does that happen? I mean, once, the, I mean. With, like within the first like couple of tries, I imagine, right? Um, or no? Yeah, it takes a little while. Once you develop a tolerance, it's like anything. It's like with alcoholics. Like if you drink every day and then you stop, you'll go through withdrawals. It's like the, it's the dependency on it. With opioids, it's harder. It's a little bit more complicated because it, it you have opioids receptors in your brain that if those get all out of whack, you know, it can, it can fuck you up. 
you know, because it's like it, you might need a, like a dependence on that. It's like it's your mood, depression, things like that. So they give a lot of addicts nowadays who are getting sober something called Suboxone, which is like a, it doesn't get you high necessarily, but it it doesn't make you go through withdrawals. So you don't get sick. That's why they take it. What was your lowest point? My lowest point was when none of my family would talk to me. My brother, I mean, my twin brother, who's like, we're not, we don't look alike, we're fraternal. But he's, he's like one of the kindest people. And even he was like, fuck you, you're a piece of shit. And then also just like, I mean, what got me to be sober was yeah. um, I moved, well, I was staying in a, in Bay, in Brighton Beach, in a home, in a, in a condemned building with a bunch of Russians that were all homeless. And there's like spray paint all over the walls. And then I would sleep there and they had these like makeshift bunk beds. And then actually kind of like, like in the movies, the cops raided it. It's big bald cop with like normal clothes with like the, um, his badge around his neck. And they're actually pretty nice. Like we couldn't stay there, but they didn't arrest anybody. But they were like, do you have anywhere to go? And I, I think I lied. I said, yes. Why did you lie though? I don't know. A shame. Yeah. It was like a shame thing. Like I didn't want to admit to it. So I ended up, um, basically, I, I was like, I got to get the fuck out of here. So I flew to Austin, Texas, of all things, because I had already kind of way in advance. My friend had bought me a flight to visit her in Austin. So I was like, well, OK, so I needed to find a place to stay. So there was this girl that I was seeing at the time. I wasn't very, like, upfront that I was homeless, you know what I mean? So, like, I mean, maybe I didn't smell great, didn't have the nicest clothes, but nobody really kind of. It hadn't like gotten to the point where people were like, oh, this guy's definitely homeless. You know, I had bosses ask me because of the smell and stuff. Like I'd get complaints. They'd be like, do you have a place to live? I'd be like, yeah. I think what I said was I have a disease. Well, right? What kind of jobs were you working at that time? I mean, they slowly got worse. I mean, like, I mean, I just was unemployable. I mean, I worked for ten different companies. Like I'd get hired, I'd get fired. I mean, it wasn't in, in 2014. It wasn't particularly hard to get a job. There was a billion jobs that would pay. So I get fired. I got fired from a lot of companies, and then trying to think remember what happened so yeah i got kicked out of there went to this girl's house spent the night said you know i'll, I'll call you when i get back into town flew to austin texas one-way ticket and then was like felt better but the problem started happening and so i started say, staying at this place called salvation army which is like a homeless shelter and i got sober in october of 2016 how old are you at that time 24 holy shit so you were like 23 years old living in a condemned house in Brighton Beach with a bunch of Russians. Yeah, yeah. They were eating raw chicken. I remember that. That was really weird. <laughs> <laughs> were your parents like, come home? Well, no. At any point? No, because, you know, well, my mom was an addict. She passed away in 2019. Oh, I'm sorry to hear it's that. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, and my, my family kind of learned from that whole sh experience that you don't enable. So they, they drew a pretty hard line in the sand. But enabling how, though? Like showing you at love? Is that enabling? In a way, it is. If you're, if you're answering the calls, you know, or if you're, in my case, like, you know, you know basically playing a part in, like, causing financial troubles. Because, like, you, you, my family doesn't necessarily have a lot of money. So you're, you're lying. You're manipulating. They love you. They give you money. You know, so they didn't do that for me, which was actually really good. Because it's like bro. you're left with an option, and the unfortunate option is, is like, do you die or do you just get sober, or like, or do you just live miserable, or worse, I guess, live miserable for fifty years. So, how long was the withdrawal period from you for you, like being sober? How difficult was it for, and how for how long? Um, I mean, obviously, it's difficult to stay sober for the rest of your life, but I mean, was there like a month where you were like, oh my god, I can't take this? Uh, a lot of it in the beginning was was tough just because it's like you want when you get sober you want people to forgive you immediately so you want people to be like oh you know i'm glad you're doing better within but like the first month within like the first yeah six months so i remember being frustrated that like i'm trying people don't my family doesn't believe me they're not talking to me they're still mad at me they're on edge when they talk to me walking around edge on eggshells and in my mind i was like it's been three months this is a big deal but then you're thinking that's you know 18 to 24 you know? well had you tried and gotten sober before and told people no no but i'd made false promises in the past yeah so i mean i didn't like try to get sober i had like said i'm gonna change i'm gonna learn this and that and you don't so have you ever seen that show um intervention before yes so there's a lot of that kind of stuff in there you know there's a lot of like people will the families a lot of the times like they don't know what to do so they just 
keep throwing money at the problem, you know. But so, did you have one of those actual interventions where you like walk in a room and all your family's No, around? no. I I went to a, basically a 12-step meeting by just to like just to like kind of get people off my back. In Austin? In Austin. Yeah. I'd never been well, <laughs> I had a coworker that took me when I was here and one of the jobs I got fired from but I you guess didn't that take point, it seriously. They planted a seed, I suppose. I was like, oh, maybe I should go here. But uh, no, not until I went to Austin. And you know what? I, for whatever reason, I just heard what I needed to hear. And that was, uh, that was October 21st of 2016. I drank like the 27th one more time. The 28th, I got sober of October. And the last time I drank, it was like just alcohol. And it wasn't, there's nothing extraordinary about it. It wasn't like. So, that. how do you feel about New York, though? You know, what's weird is like people have asked me this and they're like, does it trigger you? And I'm like, no, it doesn't because it was six years ago and I was, my life was such a mess that it's almost like I don't even remember where or what it was. Plus like my sobriety is more dictated on like the work I've done over the years. It's not well, like I go somewhere and then boom, you know, it's, uh, I'm, I'm automatically like back right. there. So, I mean, it's, it's, I haven't even thought about it to be honest with you. That's great, man. So, I mean, going back to LA or when you moved to LA, you have not had a drink or anything since being there. I haven't had a drink or a drug or nothing. Cigarette. Since, I mean, I haven't smoked a cigarette since October of 2016. Has so it been easy for you, would you say? It gets easier over time. It was tough at first. Only, only like I said, and the not drinking part was hard because it, you know, you you have all these mountains of problems that you cause for yourself. And you know that's that can be overwhelming. Is there a, anything that tempts you? Not yeah. like when everybody's drinking at the freaking dinner or something, or at the bar. You never like, oh, I want to take a sip. No, because I'm older now, so like I don't give. If I leave, I don't. I don't feel weird about it. Well, do you ever leave early because maybe you would feel uncomfortable if you stayed later, seeing everyone wasted? It's not really an uncomfortable feeling with people being drunk. It's more so like I don't want to be around drunk people. Because yeah, dude, when you're sober and drunk people are around, it's awful. It's yeah, crazy. It's, it's not, it can be fun to a point. But then it's, I, <laughs> yeah. I always say around midnight, I'm like, I'm out, you know? Nothing good happens after midnight. Mom, that's your famous quote. We got to make a t-shirt of that for you. That's crazy. She well, literally says that. If I'm doing something like at a, co- at a comedy club or something, it's sure. a little bit different because people aren't... Well, you're working. They're not wasted or if I'm just hanging out and whatever, networking or whatever. But it has not been a problem that doesn't mean it wouldn't be a problem in the future i'm just pretty on on par with my sobriety you know so good for you man yeah thank you that's great so i don't know like where all that it kind of like went into this total sidetrack but yeah so last time i was here uh, i was here three months ago the last time i was here before that was five years or whatever however long it had been since i lived here and I came back, and yeah, it, was, it wasn't weird. And then, I, you know, what's interesting is what, when I was going through that first experience. But you grew up here, right? In yeah. New York City. Yeah. Okay, so you, you like you, this is in some ways like a lot of what all you know, you know, outside from college. For me, like I did not really fully experience the how great the city could be until I went back sober, because it was just hell on so earth. So three months ago. Yeah, and I mean, it was still recovering and stuff, obviously from the pandemic, and it's continuing to. But uh, you didn't really realize like the energy or the people or like, you know, this and that, the interesting people you meet. It's the same thing in Los Angeles too, but I've lived there for three years. So you kind of take it for granted. I just feel like more so when I visited here, I was like, Oh, okay. It could have been probably a fun experience if I would have not, you know, burnt my life to the ground. Did you feel that New York kind of sucked you in at one point? You were like, I got to get out like before you were sober. Yeah. I mean, I, I thought so until I moved to Texas and had worse problems. I was like, it's me. You know, but being sober makes everything easier. You know, I mean, I know like Los Angeles like fucks with people's heads a lot in a weird way. And like the the comedy, I have a lot of friends that moved out there with high hopes, but maybe didn't really realize how expensive it was going to be, or you know that it's not a quick path. And so people end up just kind of you run into a lot of people there that are there. They don't like living there. They're not working towards their their goal and entertainment. And they're just kind of working and they're living there and they're unhappy. I feel like that if that would have, if I would still be drinking, first of all, I don't know that I, I, wouldn't, wouldn't, I wouldn't be here. I, I don't know if I'd be, I wouldn't be dead necessarily. I might be in jail. I might be still homeless. Did you ever go to jail? I did, yeah, several times. <laughs> For how, how long was your longest stint? <laughs> a year. 
a year. But I mean, I never was charged. Um, that's another long story. We got time. Okay, so when I was in Austin, Texas, I was like causing problems for myself. And I don't know what happened. I got drunk. I blacked out. I passed out in somebody else's car. I didn't, break, I didn't steal the car. I just passed out in the car. And I got arrested. I got put in jail for a year. In I'm not going to say what city it was in in Texas. It was around Central Texas. But for reasons I'll get into later. But, yeah, I mean, I went to jail. So I was there for a year. Because, if because you, you fell asleep in someone's car when you were drunk? Well, they were trying to accuse me of trying to steal the car. But you were passed out, wasted passed in the out, back seat. Back, yeah. Well, this poor college girl found me just passed out in the back of her seat. You know. And Texas has a lot of like, this is my property kind of laws. Yeah. No, like if yeah. you go on somebody's property in Texas, are no, you allowed to shoot, shoot you them with a and shotgun? No questions asked. <laughs> no, so that's what I mean about like falling asleep in the back of someone's car. I can imagine. This I guess they like could that. have shot me. This was a college kid though, so I don't know that she really knew what to do. It was like a young. It was, so it's like after a night out at the bar. She might have been my age, you know, at the time. I don't know. You look back being a little bit older and you remember it it was a night out who knows what i was doing i blacked out you know i I was blacking out all the time so i go get arrested and i'm not in communication with my family so i don't have to pay i can't pay bail it's not cheap i think it was like fifty thousand, or i can't remember the exact amount but then you have to come up with 10 percent, right you call bail bondsman but I felt like in a little, and I had a friend asked me this, my friend Channing back in, in LA, but he's like, why didn't you just do, I was like, cause I kind of think part of me didn't trust myself to go out there and to do it. So I was like, I'm just going to do the time. The charges got dropped. So I don't have any criminal record because when I, that first night I was arrested, the cops beat the living shit out of me. Like they hog tied me and, and beat me up. And I woke up fucked up, not like going to the hospital fucked up. It ended up being a really big deal because, like, a, an attorney I got found out, and then, you know, they, they didn't want any lawsuits to happen, so they actually dismissed all the charges. So they were like, well, what are we going to do? Like, they were like, here's the thing. Don't get arrested for six months. We'll dismiss all the charges, and, you know, we want you to get sober. Here's a, here's a place we can go. as a Salvation Army in South Austin, which I stayed and got, you know, ended up getting sober. But... Before uh, before all that, I had a roommate, and I mean, I just, I mean, I, I was just made her life a mess too. I mean, in Austin, I stole money from her, you know, got a, almost got us evicted, and then that's when I, I made the agreement to move out. So there was a lot of stuff that happened in between then, but then when I went to jail here in New York once, and it was because I. Um, I got into a taxi. Bro, just be, sorry to mean to interrupt you right now. The path that you have taken to get on this couch from the life that you previously lived is incredible, man. Oh, well, I, will, I will go ahead and just let you guys listening and watching know that, yes, that's exactly what the fuck I'm thinking. But please, <laughs> go ahead, Sam. So I got arrested here. That was the first time I got arrested. It was because I got into a taxi without any money. Here? Yeah, Bro, here. I think that, that one time may have happened to me. I was like 16. I just did the... Uh, the like fake swipe the credit card and sprinted out of the taxi, but you got arrested for that. He locked me in the back seat. And you were drunk at the time. I was drunk. Yeah. Well, I didn't really. <laughs> I mean, I'm laughing because I don't even think I knew I didn't have money on me. The embarrassing part about all that whole situation because it's not a very serious. It's a class A misdemeanor. At least it was at the time. Not even. It's not close to a felony. They let they let me go. I didn't have to actually go downtown. They like gave me a, a desk appearance ticket or whatever. Like okay. I had to go to the court date got a public attorney <laughs> so i was so broke the first time i went to court i oh, man, my poor public attorney he's like they're like okay so you just got to pay the cab fare of 25 dollars i didn't have 25 dollars to my name so she's like she's like that's not possible and then the, these young prosecutors that are working their way up the low level criminal court were like what she's like she's like he doesn't have twenty five dollars. Your your or sir, or whatever your honor. I don't think they were talking to the judge. They were talking to the prosecutors, and they were like, they pushed it out six 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 weeks. I went back and I, I paid it. You had to pay another money order from Seven Eleven. Where were you living at this time? Uh, the second time, the first time, uh, well, both times I was in and out of homelessness. The, the last time I was, where was I staying? I can't remember to be honest where I was staying at that time. I get a I get a couple apartments, in between the homelessness. What was the most traumatic experience in jail? It wasn't really traumatic. Um, 
Like you were, you were cool with being there. What do you mean? I, I got a job, uh, just like working in the kitchen. You just work twelve hours a day. I mean, you you can, it, you know, it, you have to think of it. It's not like it wasn't like prison, you know. So it wasn't like you were stuck there, you know, indefinitely. Everybody was kind of filtering in and out, going to and from, meeting bail, court date stuff. I stayed the maximum you can stay at like a county jail facility. I think it was like a year or whatever. Some people are there a little bit longer, um, but it wasn't like the, some of the jails in California where like if you got to join a, it wasn't like there was no there might have been gangs you didn't have to do it you know it was mostly people that were waiting their court dates for lower level types of things you know low, low, lower level felonies and whatnot. Did you ever think that you would get sober, or was it just one day you woke up and you're like no more of this shit? No, I think when I was in college. So my mom was an alcoholic, and so I didn't want to end up like that. I thought AA meetings would, or or twelve step meetings, whatever, would be like the worst thing that could ever happen to me. Did you first start drinking really in college? Yeah, I was kind of late to that because I was a Catholic school kid, and I wasn't. I I played sports, but we weren't really the the party kids. Like my friends, we would we were more like the play Madden and eat pizza kids. So the first um, the first time I drank was in high school. And I did get really sick because you, you, I don't know if you remember the first time you drank. But you probably, you, <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure I barfed. You don't really know like what's too much. You drink like a little bit of vodka, a little bit of whiskey, a little bit of tequila, and then a few yeah, beers. Yeah. Well, I had a. It was I actually remember exactly what we drank because I when I smell it to this day, I still puke. And this was 15 years ago, but it was Captain Morgan spiced rum. Ugh, that'll get you too. It was so gross, um, and I got so drunk. Uh, I had a football game the next day, and I, I could not play. I was so sick. I think I had alcohol poisoning looking back because I felt sick for like three days. Yeah, that's that happened to me. Seem normal. No, dude, that's like even worse than the hangover. Yeah. You just like were throwing up acid or whatever. Yeah, like I felt sick, and I, I actually didn't go home for three days. It's, that gives you a little bit of an idea what like the home th- life was like. Like I, my, they nobody gave a shit. I wasn't home for three days. There's just no real accountability. It's amazing I didn't get into more trouble in high school. And um, I came home. I got pulled over right outside the neighborhood I grew up in by a cop. I thought I was still drunk. It was three days later. I didn't drink. I just was so sick. So I remember thinking I was going to get arrested. The, <laughs> the officer asked me to spell my middle name, which is Broderick. It's my mom's maiden name. I didn't. I couldn't. I couldn't spell it. I felt so sick. He probably thought I was an idiot. He's well, like, did you go to jail at that point? No, 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 because I wasn't drunk. Um, he probably is like, this kid smells... I was 16 or what, however old I was, 17. He's like, this kid's this kid's drunk, but he's he's not drunk. He, he might be sick. He might be smell bad, but he, so he just gave me a warning. I just drove home. So, question about your tattoos. How long have you had all of them? Uh, well, none of them are, are jail-related. I should... They're just bad decisions. Um... How long have I had my first tattoo? I got eight days after I turned eighteen, and then every so uh, every few years or so, I get more, you know, a few at a time. Was there a particular time you got tattoos when you were high on drugs? Yeah, so I actually this one right here. So um, it's for the people on on the camera. It's a it's a pinup girl wearing a rose as a dress, holding her boob. I, I can't make this stuff up. It's 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 so I was I was drunk when I got that. I was blacked out drunk. I woke up here with it. I like it was like one of the, one of my first few we, before I became homeless. I just woke up. I had a forearm tattoo. And I, I mean, I I never thought I would get a forearm tattoo because I mean, things have changed with tattoos. They're much more accepting than they used to be. But in 2014, it was still a little taboo. So I woke up with it. I so let's talk about your passion, man. Let's get into it. Comedy. Yes. Has this brought you a significant amount of joy on stage to where I don't want to say it's similar to how you previously have felt doing certain drugs, but maybe it kind of is. Uh, yeah, it is. Well, first of all, it's like it's once you get that, like, like you'll hear a lot of people, you get that bug, like you just love doing it. Comedy it bug? comes an obsession in a way. Getting laughs on stage, like actually crushing on a show and feeling like I had the best set out of all the comics there which is like in my head, I'm competitive sometimes like that. And if I see somebody that's really funny, I, there's a part of me that doesn't like them just because I'm jealous that they're so funny. Um, even though I, I don't, you know, I, I, I realize that and I don't, I generally don't. Like yeah. Them. Like everybody can eat what you know. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, but you get that that room laughing, and you get a, maybe like you get a couple Instagram DMs of people that are like you really funny. Yeah, like it's right you. to the veins, bro. It's 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 very addicting. <laughs> yeah, it is. So I mean, ever since I started when I was twenty six ish, you know, I started a little bit later than than some do, like, for obvious reasons. Um, yeah, I mean. I like nothing else mattered as much. My career, you know, I have good, I have a decent sales gig, but it's it takes secondary to, to stand up. Love Every, it, man. Everything does. What what about yourself? In terms of what? When's the first time you tried and stand up? Yeah. So um, I've been follow. I had been following around my buddy to comedy shows like right when I graduated from college in two thousand and like yeah, same time as you, like two thousand fourteen. So like from the ages of like twenty three. How old are 24, you? 25. I'm 30. 30 okay, same so age, yeah. for those like three years, I was following around my buddy Giulio Gallerati to comedy shows. And like now he has a Netflix special. Like he's a very accomplished uh, comedian. I'm op- opening for him. Actually, as you guys are listening to this, I opened for him on Sunday in Boston. So if you guys are in Boston and you were there or you weren't there, well, it happened and we had a great time. But um, I would just follow him around to comedy shows. And like I slowly got the bug. It took me ultimately like another year and a half to even go on an open mic or like do five minutes on his show and then i got super involved in improv and ucb here so i was doing a ton of improv and then once the pandemic hit i just started doing way more stand-up comedy because like i I was always doing improv and i always really liked improv but i knew that to be in new york i needed to um just do way more stand-up it did close here ucb closed improv was a huge part of my life and then stand-up just in general i was going to shows so i've known everyone in the industry for years and then for the most part the past like two and a half years i've really been doing it like full time and grinding and like doing my own show so how does how did you get hooked up at the stand um i had a show in chelsea and then i spoke to the owner at the stand who i have known just because like going around to comedy shows for years with julio and stuff i had known the owner of the old stand and i told him that i was doing a show at a show in chelsea he was like why don't you come do your show over here so like as of a year and change ago we just started doing the ted jones comedy show at the stand and it's been going great ever since so i think initially it was just having my own show at another venue and then just moving it to the stand what a lot of people tell me is that the stand is like the new place for like young comics to come up i think it really reminds me of like a high school cafeteria bro like anytime people go and hang out at a place and they're not booked for a show like that's where people go to the stand like you don't really see other people hanging in droves the way you do at the stand when they're not booked that particular night like people just go to the stand randomly on a night like like a tuesday night whatever like even the night that we had our show people are just hanging there from 8 p.m on just talking shooting the shit whatever you don't even need to be on a show there just because like this it's a great space you know they have like their kind of comic hangout area and then also they have four shows a night that people are on and it's a good central area also because like a lot of trains come through union square it's not like you'd go out to a story and that's the only comedy club there it's like people go through union square to get to the upper west side go to the upper east downtown brooklyn so it is a very central spot it's big it's nice and they have great shows there it does seem like they're here there's all these like smaller rooms that people just pop from show to show you know doing like you know you can i somebody was telling me that uh, what they did was they they would they got twelve shows a week just from barking, for shows, something like that. That's maybe, a lot. Maybe not a week, maybe it was a month. Like that's a lot though. Well, I, that's a lot. Of, I mean, I I see these people at like when you walk down McDougal Street and you see a bunch of people like out know, on the street barking, especially on the weekends. Yeah, I mean that's that's something that doesn't really exist in Los Angeles. Yeah, and there's no real way to do it unless no you like go to, to the it. Larchmont Cheese Stop shop you know what i mean like, <laughs> I guess park you outside like there. downtown and like central market or yeah but like for the most part i feel like that ultimately wouldn't work do you have your eyes set on any particular venues that you'd like to bring um your show fat set at um i want to move both shows and do a similar so you, thing. you have two show one is fat set one is fat set one's the impulse comedy which is my and then one that's the one that i did impulse yeah, comedy because i don't think fat set fell in in the time frame that you were going to be there so Fat Set is like my a like you call it A or B show. Like I don't know if that's the terminology I use. A B, so maybe like a C show. Some people have three shows, you know, where they they do that. I have these two shows. So my weekly show, it's a workout room. I, I mainly put on my friends and people like from out of town if I don't have a fat sets and it's a good way to work out material. And sometimes, you know, like you saw, people walk up, I go to all the tables, I say, Hey, there's a show and sometimes, you know, 
three weeks ago there was like 30 people in that room oh wow some weeks there's two so it's a way for me to go up there and like not worrying about people judging my set i just try stuff see if it works and then fat sets i try to get you know friends up and comers and then i do a lot of work to try to get an audience there as many people as i can which is a, a bit of a it's a task in la if you can get an audience in los angeles outside of comedy club it's you learn a lot there. That's one thing I would say there. You learn a lot about what the what people who are producing shows do, the tips that you know. Like we talked a little bit about it. You do a lot of it there. There, there's like to get people to a comedy show in Los Angeles. It takes a lot of work to get people who are normal people, unless you're asking people to bring people or you have a big email list. So that's the other thing. You can't just you can't bark. So there's not enough people that are like I think investing the time and the energy. But there's those staple five six you know seven eight nine ten shows that are really good that are competitive to try to get on out there i'd say for the most part i don't want to say you'll have an easy time placing your shows here but i'm sure before you move here you'll have a you'll have a few dates you know just with the amount of people you know here also yeah my my plan is to you know sometime in no late october early november lock down a couple venues and start moving it and then i'm gonna do fat sets once every three months in la still oh dope so i'm gonna kind of because with remote work nowadays for my, my day job sales, I can do whatever I want. That's great, man. How does your family feel about you doing comedy? Um, they don't really get... Well, my, my, my dad is like... He's kind of... As long as he's not... As, as long as Sam's life is doing okay, I don't give a shit what he does. I think he is. I think he, Actually, you know, I think he's, I think he's proud. I, I, maybe not of the comedy stuff per se, because... I don't think he gets it because he's an old Jewish guy. Has he seen you live? <laughs> um, not, not yet. No, no. Oh, damn, bro. Well, we got to get that to happen. I think if I was out here, my stepmom is originally from New Jersey. And I think that they would have, I don't think they want to fly, go out to LA because it's like they live in Memphis, Tennessee. So maybe they would come to Jersey for a little bit. They would come and to they New come York into the city. they go to New York. Together. Love it, man. They don't really, they weren't really going to LA. Like my stepbrother just moved there, but they would come here. I mean, you know. I, I actually, they were just there helping my stepbrother move in, and I, I was like, my bar show, I was like, eh, I don't know if you guys want to go to this term. You guys might be the only people there. And it ends up 50 people are there. And like some two comics invited like all of their friends. Yeah, and, I love it. And when like, I went there, there was, there was a good amount of people there too. Bro, it was hot as shit though. <laughs> so it, was like, it was like May 5th. I was like, this is not normal. Well, it was, it's also in an, in an attic. In a oh, bar, okay, okay. A bar, it was so. not an attic, but it's, yeah. It's a loft. Upstairs yeah, loft, loft of the bar. I, it's, it feels <laughs> like. It feels, <laughs> <laughs> it feels like an attic. Yeah, sure, maybe. Yeah. Well, have you been to Austin, Texas to do Dude, comedy? Dude, no. I went to El Paso when I was... 14 years old for a tennis tournament during the summer. That's the only time I've ever El been to Paso. Texas. I actually yeah. love El Paso. Random. Really? It's an underrated Texas city. If you're a white guy and there's tons of just beautiful Hispanic women everywhere. Oh, I gotta go back, dude! Yeah, so it's good for if you're a single guy. Because like, they, they do think you have money if you're white. <laughs> <laughs> so, but then you have war, as, so it's like, they're kind of like together. Yeah, yeah, Austin. I lived in Austin before the big boom of people that moved Okay. Out. But you could go out there. You should go out there if you get an opportunity because there's a lot of really even like it seems like even there, even the, the bar shows have regular audience that are like paying attention. And also the influx of people, I guess, from like maybe New York and also L.A. People are going to Austin, just like more people who like entertainment. Yeah. Comedy fans for sure. Cool. Sam, thank you so much for coming on the podcast, bro. And just being super vulnerable, man. We really do appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for having me. And um uh, Thanks to all the guys who listen. Oh, of course, man. So uh, why don't you shout out your uh, Instagram right here? We'll pop it up. Follow so just, Sam. Uh, just Samuel Bilski, no spaces at Instagram. And then I have a podcast as well. Shout Sam, it out. Samuel Bilski podcast. You can find it on. Love there. it, man. We'll look forward to seeing you in New York, man, and on the Ted Jones Comedy Show when you get back here, right? Sounds good, man. Sam, thanks so much. We'll see you guys next time. Peace. Peace.